Wow, this, this year has been truly thunderful, and 2020 is shaping up as well. Um, uh, just so you know, uh, I have had some technical difficulties, and I tried to fix them yesterday, and I haven't managed to do so, so you have to deal with some dodgy frame rates through this presentation today. I'm really sorry about that. Also, I'm battling a sore throat, so we'll see how long my <laughs> voice will actually last. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll cut it short. And I'll try to keep my enthusiasm down, so... See if we can save it up. Uh, <laughs> so it's really interesting and fun to be back and see a couple of familiar faces again. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marcus Ingerson. I work as lead designer at Soink on our upcoming title, Lost in Random, uh, which is published by EA under their EA Originals label. Um, so just want to point out quickly that that's not the official logo. Like, the, here's, one, here's one of the problems. Like, the title of the game has officially been revealed, but not the actual logo, so I have to swap it out for one of my own abominations. Uh, <laughs> so this is just going to be like 40 minutes of me uh, talking really vaguely about what it is that I do. Um, so how did I end up lost in a forest dressed in a Hawaii shirt? Um, y if we jump almost two years uh, back in time, uh, I had been teaching here for almost seven years. Um, and I found myself being in a situation where I had more reasons to leave than to stay. Um, and I have saved up some what you might call fuck up, fuck up fund. <laughs> Basically, so my plan was just basically to just take a year off and like figure out what my next step should be. But I never got that far. You see, I saw this uh, ad for that Soink was looking for an assistant producer, and I knew a couple of people who uh, worked there uh, recently, and I also knew uh, Klaus Lüngele, the CEO of the company, which I had met a couple of years prior. Um, so I applied for the position, and I got the job. Um, as assistant producer and office manager at Soink. Um, and this was right before the reorganization when we moved in together with Image and Form as part of Thunderful. And um, one of the first thing I did was to help out with um, shipping of Flipping Death. Um, and help out with planning of uh, events and expos and ran practicalities in the office uh, together with Marco Poda at Image and Form. Um, and at this time, um, I also helped out with the planning of the demo, uh, which later became uh, Lost in Random, which by that time went under another name. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but after we uh, moved to our new office, uh, I got dragged more into the Thunderful publishing side of, of things, uh, which had just uh, required Rising Star. And my main purpose then was to help out with uh, practicalities around that merger and also uh, be an external producer for a team that uh, was uh, developing a title over in Japan. But then 
things took another turn. Because <laughs> um, I had been thinking about Lost in Random and how there was just some things that I wanted to improve with how the game functioned at that point. So I basically just uh, held a pitch for Klaus where I presented uh, my analysis and what I thought were the issues and poten potential solutions to that. And we discussed it some more, and at some point we both felt That's like... Great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. A very uh, accurate uh, depiction. Um, so basically it went like, hey, I like it. You're lead designer now. Um, so I, I don't know, let, let that be a lesson to you kids. Never tell anyone, one, anyone about your ideas, because you're going to end up with a lot of responsibility. So don't. <laughs> um, but this is just like, sounds like a bunch of name dropping, right? So like Thunderfall and Soink and wha what is this? So let's just do a quick summary of this perfect storm, or what do you want to call it? Um, so Thunderfall was formed in 2017, uh, primarily as a soft merger uh, between the two studios, Soink and Image and Form. Uh, and both uh, still operate on their own, but under the same umbrella. Um, since both companies share the same part owner, Bergsala, uh, and we already shared some resources, it just felt like the next logical step that we should just, you know, gather everyone on the same roof. Or as uh, Breauten would put it, stop living in sin. <laughs> um, so Thunderfall is the umbrella that basically holds two game developing studios and two publishers. Uh, so let's start with uh, the other studio, Image and Form, uh, which was <laughs> uh, which was funded two decades ago uh, by Breauten Sigurd Geirsson. He returned to Gothenburg in '96 after spent uh, most of his career as a lead programmer at the multimedia company in Tokyo. And in early 2000, they got contracted to finish off uh, uh, development of an edutainment title, uh, which then led to a series of edutainment titles. Um, and in 2009, they started to develop uh, their own games based on their own IPs. Um, so they had their first success in 2010, followed in 2011 with SteamWorld Tower Defense and Ant Hill. Um, they continued to focus on console games uh, with the release of SteamWorld Dig in 2012 for the 3DS, which led to a string of different critically acclaimed titles uh, spending uh, multiple genres in the SteamWorld universe. Most notable being SteamWorld Dig 2, which is listed as number two on Polygon's top 12 essential indie Metroidvania games of all time. Uh, woo! <laughs> and uh, the latest installment, SteamWorld Quest, which was also noted a position on Polygon's top 10 games in 2019 so far, back in September, I think it was. <laughs> um, and moving on to the second studio, which is where I currently wreck havoc, uh, namely Sonic. And Sonic was founded by Klaus Lüngeled, and he's been making games for various companies since the early 90s. And in 98, he moved to Laguna Beach to work at Shiny Entertainment uh, as a lead artist. And Shiny is probably best known for the cult classic titles such as Earthworm Jim and uh, MDK and Messiah, for instance. Um, but Shiny Entertainment was also tasked with developing the, um, at the time, ambitious cross-media experience coincided with the second and third uh, uh, installation in the Matrix uh, uh, film series. So this was a game called Enter the Matrix, and fun fact, Klaus was actually tasked to take photos of Keanu Reeves for the textures for that game. Uh, unfortunately, the studio where they were supposed to uh, take the photos didn't have a free set at that time, so they had to set up gears in a toilet. <laughs> a truly breathtaking experience, I'm sure. <laughs> so what do you do? You do for a living? Oh, I do body scans of Keanu Reeves in the bathroom. Hey. <laughs> Uh, but Klaus was uh, having an eager to focus more on his own project rather than working on others, so he moved back to Europe and founded Soink uh, early 2000. And after a string of different types of uh, projects, Soink in its current form was more crystallized in 2011, uh, when it started to focus solely on making games. And they had their first uh, hit in 2013 with Stick It To The Man, followed by Zombie Vikings in 2015. And then in 2018, Sonic made the major headlines with Fair, being the very first title released under EA's new label, EA Originals. 
Uh, and later that year, I joined, uh, right before we shipped Flipping Death. And earlier this spring, Sonic released its latest title, which is Ghost Giant uh, for PlayStation VR. And it's also coming to Oculus Quest this month. And right now, we're working on Lost in Random. Uh, let's just move on to the latest addition to the Thunderful Cloud, which is Rising Star. Um, so 2018 was a really busy year for Thunderful. Uh, so Thunderful Publishing has just, just kicked off uh, with image and form and song titles mainly, as well as acquiring Rising Star. And Rising Star is a publisher whose main focus is to scout Japanese titles and localizing them in the Western region. Uh, Rising Star has a broad catalogue of uh, titles ranging from Harvest Moon series to cult classics such as No More Heroes and Deadly Premonition. Uh, and for your Deadly Premonition fans out there, you've probably already seen that there's a sequel in the making. Mm. Really happy about that. Um, and both Thunderful Publishing and Rising Star Games are led by Ed Valiente, who's the former business developer at Nintendo of Europe. So we have a highly skilled team in our hands. So that's like basically a short summary of everything that we do. <sighs> but on top of that, <laughs> uh, Thunderful Publishing also published titles by other indie developers. So like we recently released Lonely Mountains Downhill and Curious Expedition 1, an upcoming sequel, Curious Expedition 2, and recently revealed Say No More. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, there's a fuck ton of things going on at once under one roof, which is really, really inspiring uh, place to be at right now. Um, in total, we are about 80 people, uh, 80 people working at the office in Gothenburg. And yes, contrary to popular beliefs, Gothenburg does exist, and it's not just a map in Overwatch 2. You're welcome to check it out for yourself. <laughs> so, um, that's enough name dropping, at least for, for now. Sorry, could I have another coffee? Because it really hurts my throat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, back to Lost in Random. Um, the team on Lost in Random is roughly 25 people in house, plus another five people we use for outsource work. Um, right now, we're heading uh, for Alpha earlier next year, if everything goes to plan, which it should, since that's one of my responsibilities. <laughs> So, as a lead designer on Lost in Random, I'm responsible for planning and documentation and conducting playtests and communicating uh, the overarching design of, uh, of the gameplay. So, that basically is that I leave incomprehensible hieroglyphs on whiteboards, hoard old boxes to build paper prototypes, keep a highly organized stack of post-it notes with important fixes, feedback, reference, deadlines and ideas, and spread inspirational quotes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's more of the jokey bits, but more precisely, me and the other leads together with our producer and uh, directors, uh, we plan out and coordinate the overall uh, coordination of the project. So we sit down and plan out every milestone, and then me and the rest of the design team, uh, we decide what we will work on, on for the upcoming sprints in order to meet our milestone deliveries. Um, so, for me, it's actually less uh, actual design and more identifying potential solutions to problems as, as they come up. <laughs> so, how do we break down and estimate the workload? That was the fun part. <laughs> so, this is usually the process we go through. So, since um, Sonic focused mainly on uh, narrative-driven games, uh, so there's usually an overarching story, which we try to follow, which is divided into different chapters, which we, in this case, define as levels. And each level in the game then goes through these different phases. So there's usually there's a script that outlines the basic for the plot uh, and what should happen in that level, like key NPCs that the player should interact with, etc. And then we go over to uh, a concept art phase, and the script is uh, accompanied with some concept art to like capture the mood and feel of that level. And this is like uh, actual concept art from one of our levels. 
Um, then we make a rough plan on how to achieve this, and this is then turned into a white box, uh, outlining the overall sense of pacing of that level. Like, where do we add more interactions? Uh, the player needs to see you over here, and w um, but can't right now. Do we need to rearrange this area? That building over there is blocking this view. Uh, should we be really be able to climb this high up? Because that means that we have to have a further away distance and have more models. Maybe we should just lower it instead. Things like that. Um, and the next thing that happens is that the level artist makes an art slice, and that's just one small piece of, an, of a full uh, level, so it's just a small area, which then gets uh, polished and lit to completion in order to capture what it, the finished result would look like. And this is so we can further estimate how long it will actually take to produce and decorate uh, the whole level, like how many assets do we need and how long will that take, and um, do we even need to make adjustments to the level uh, b based on the total workload uh, and performance and pacing, and you know, there's a lot of things that goes into this. And after that, we move into uh, the skeleton phase, uh, which is the alpha. So this is when the rest of the level gets decorated. First iteration of gameplay is uh, incorporated. Combat scenarios are implemented. Dialogues and NPCs are implemented. Ambient sound effects added, etc., etc., etc. And then we move over to the zombie phase, which is beta, where everything is refined and bugs are getting to get squashed. And then it's the suit phase, which is the final touches uh, before we send it, off our, send it off our gold candidate for release. And of course, in, in parallel to this process, uh, code and gameplay teams builds uh, systems and other uh, gameplay related assets that are implemented continuously as the process goes on. So usually when there's something new that has been tested or tried out, the level design team goes back and adds another layer on top with those elements. So when I say um, layers, I'm talking about like in terms of like vertical slices or horizontal slices. So um, we are, for this project, we are planning out the project horizontally rather than vertically. Uh, now, most of you are probably familiar with the vertical approach. Uh, and vertical slices works great for prototypes, uh, but the thing is that there are usually some systems that are more complex to make uh, than others, and depending on the complexity of your game and time restraints, um, there might be certain layers that needs to be more fleshed out than others. So then a vertical slice then rarely results like in a nice slice as, <laughs> as this one. It's rather than each layer are like in different sizes and in different shapes, and it feels kind of wonky and all. So, since Sonic primarily are making narrative-driven games, uh, a horizontal slice approach is more preferable for us. And the reason for that, uh, working horizontally rather than vertically, gives us the advantage of planning out the plot and being able to run it through from the start. Like, we can actually run through in our mind what the whole game will be like within a month time, actually. Um, and this makes it easy for us to find flaws early on and be make uh, better estimated and guesses. Um, and it makes it easier for us to, uh, for adjustments early on. Um, because we know the story and we need to make adjustments, we can still deliver a cohesive story to that. So, because like, how many times have you played a game and a bit in, you start to feel like everything is getting really rushed and all of a sudden it just wraps up and then it's done. Uh, <laughs> and that's probably because they spent too much time on the earlier segments and then didn't have time to actually make it a full length uh, experience. So like it's, have, have you seen that meme like with a horse like that has four, four different stations? Yeah, it's basically it basically be becomes that experience and that's what we want to avoid. <laughs> so. So this also helps us keep uh, the big vision intact. Um, it's easier to process solutions for potential problems over a longer period of time when you can actually walk through the level, even though it's a very early and crude stage, um, to actually getting a sense of what the space is getting uh, to feel like, and maybe you get new ideas of like, oh, we can utilize this, or this is a nice space, but we can't function it here, but we can move it over into this level instead, because we still like this, this type of experience. Okay, let's do that then. Um, 
or if things start to feel more repetitive, oh, this space, we need to do something about that, because otherwise uh, people will fall out and be bored. <laughs> um, so something that began as a, a vague idea now slowly starts to transform, layer by layer being added to from a humble sketch until you reach something that resembles this. <laughs> hmm. So the horizontal uh, slice approach. The pros, of, of course, is since it's a story-driven game, we can adjust for it. Uh, finding out early uh, what quests uh, takes too long, and uh, this happens in the wrong order, or uh, this drags out for too long, and this part feels rushed, and this part needs to be fleshed out. Um, now we can fix it early on in the process. Flawless results, guaranteed success, bulletproof, no That's problem. Great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. Mm. So um, the downside, of course, like <laughs> there, it's not without flaws. Like since it takes longer to see the full results, uh, it's important to keep the lead time at the minimum for us. And therefore, we'll make sure that each iteration is uh, kept as short as possible um, and running other types of tests in parallel to the more long-term goals. Uh, so what does that process look like? Um, so I'm just going to switch to gray now, or like light white. So, you know, there's going to be no jokes from now on. It's just not any colorful ones at least. So let's get serious. Uh, <laughs> I, I think like this is probably one of my favorite or like one of the best illustrations of like what uh, an iterative, iterative process looks like. And it's from Clinton Keith's book, Agile Game Development with Scrum. So. At the beginning, we established like, uh, what our vision or goal uh, for our project would be. And then we break down each component and estimate how much time we can allocate to certain tasks uh, in order to reach our goal, basically. And each bigger iteration cycle is time boxed. So if we define those iteration cycles as our milestones instead, uh, it would look something like this. And these contains broader definitions of we have agreed upon in collaboration with our publisher to deliver. Uh, but as you know, it's that funny thing that initial ideas have a tendency to, let's say, move around a bit. So if you're just sticking to your initial plan, you're going to miss your target. So each milestone also have a, a subset of goals and adjustments based on the findings we do for each iteration. So we can hit our goal, which is to deliver a tight game experience. So by constantly nudging uh, our milestone uh, deliverers in the direction of our intended goal, uh, we have a better chance of succeeding. And in order to make these adjustments, we have two parallel processes. Um, so the first one is this. Each milestone is divided into four sprints. And each sprint is a two week long. So as I said, we, went, we want to minimize lead time, so therefore we run two-week sprints. And each discipline makes their own sprint plan and at the beginning uh, of a sprint, and then we do a collective sprint review with uh, all the teams at the end. And parallel to that, we have what we also uh, call task forces. Uh, while our sprint, uh, sprint plans usually are more rigid um, within a certain uh, type of field. Uh, the task forces are usually consistent of people from different disciplines, and they are tasked with either researching or solving a specific problem. Uh, unlike what's being defined in a sprint plan, the task force runs parallel to this, uh, to the sprint plan schedule. Uh, and that means that depending on what the purpose of that task force is, it can Mm, uh, run a shorter period of time, it might not even run a full sprint, or it can run over multiple sprints or even uh, over multiple uh, milestones, depending on the complexity of the problems that needs to get uh, solved. So during this time, we also do regular checkups uh, with the task force to determine if uh, someone should leave the task force because they have fulfilled their purpose in that specific tar for uh, task force or uh, if they maybe need more people, maybe they don't have the right competence uh, in their task force to solve the problem uh, through test data. Um, or maybe if it should be dissolved because they have solved the problem or put on pause until a dependency has been lifted uh, or just continue in its current form. 
Um, so like these are multiple methods that we utilize uh, in this uh, product, which in combination results in a mixture of everything, which is the water scrum and fall method. Hooray! <laughs> the silver bullet for all your managing, managing uh, needs, resulting in flawless execution and great success every time. <laughs> That's great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. <laughs> so, um, jokes aside, what, what we're doing is that we are constantly evaluating not just the game itself, but our process. Uh, and we are evaluating our tools and how we are actually working. Uh, it's not just the game that is important. It's important to take care of your team also. And we are... <laughs> most likely not done yet. Uh, this is just the latest iteration of our workflow. Um, the important thing is to adapt the processes after what the team feels is the best way of working uh, so they can achieve their goals uh, and what leads to the best result rather than sticking to a set formula. Um, if the system isn't working, um, you have to adapt the needs to the team, not the other way around. Um, and as with everything else in a project, the process needs to be iterated itself. Um, so that's what we're doing. We are constantly evaluating our processes as well as the game as we move forward. TV. So, um, <coughs> my voice is still holding up. Good. Um, <laughs> enough of the gray. Go back to the colors again. Um, so that's what it looks like on the production side of things. Uh, and I would love to talk more about the actual gameplay design of Lost in Random, uh, but since we haven't actually revealed that much about what the actual gameplay is yet, I can't really go into specific. Um, I jokingly say that um, it's like Suda51 made Mario Kart, and it's <laughs> or maybe Pac-Man, uh, <laughs> but that, that's I'm only half joking actually. It, it, it's quite esoteric, uh <laughs> which also is a huge problem in itself, uh, and that's something I would probably talk in a post-mortem, uh, or a dissection, if you will. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, if you happen to be in Gothenburg, uh, please come by, and you can sign an NDA, and you can actually play test the game. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for new victims. Play testers! Testers, I mean. Uh <laughs> so... Um, so um, I'm going to mention a couple of aspects of, of um, randomness in games in general instead uh, on a surface level uh, that might be useful to some of you to think about, um, which is a segment I call uh, not getting lost in randomness. So <coughs> usually randomness in games is, uh, is a sort of chaos element. Uh, that should add variety or uh, unpredictable outcomes, uh, resulting in an interesting tactical uh, choice for the player. And I'm excluding gambling in this case, but talking primarily about games. Um, I, don't, I don't remember who said that like a game is a series of interesting choices. I, I, I saw a Twitter post yesterday about somebody said like, what a game is, is a it's a series of non-interest. No, a, a game is a series of choice, non-choices presenting in an interestingly way, <laughs> which is like, yeah, that's probably more like it, yeah. <laughs> um, but when it comes to random in games, like you had to find a balance between like randomization or chaos element and agency. Um, too much randomness means that the player doesn't feel like they have any agency, uh, which isn't very interesting or. Uh, might even be frustrating. Um, and no unpredictable elements um, makes the game dull. And um, since there is only one obvious way to solve a problem, then you're just going through the motions. So uh, mind you, it, in that case, it doesn't have to be a specific random element. Of course, it could be something else, like just withholding information for the player, for instance. But for the sake of argument, I'm talking about randomization. So mm, take Tetris, for instance. Like, uh, not knowing what the third next block in the, the string of blocks would be adds to the tactical decision that you have to take. Um, so the overall philosophy for certain systems in Lost in Random, for instance, is to make the player feel lucky or rather unlucky, rather than go, oh boy, I guess that was random. Because uh, usually you utilize some sort of RNG or random number generation for your game, right? So 
and it's usually some sort of form of uh, um, pseudo-random generation since it's a formula it can be uh, repeated over time depending on the range of course but uh, usually it works fine for games but it becomes more complex uh, when it comes to like for instance encryptions uh, for instance, like the uh, Cloudflare company uses a setup of 100 lava lamps on a wall, which they stream constantly video footage from, and then they take that data and turn that into the seed to for their encryption randomization. And that's kind of an overkill if you want to... That type of security isn't needed for a game. Because <laughs> um, here's the secret. Like, people in general are really, really bad at defining or even know what random really means. Like, everyone has their own version of what they interpret as random. So, in fact, and especially for games, the sense of randomness and a sense of what is fair is more important than it actually being truly random. Uh, and to quote Daniel Cook, for instance, uh, however, perception of randomness is a state of mind that can exist independent of the rule set. So, if you, and if you don't know who Daniel Cook is, he's a famous uh, game designer, and you should definitely check out his blog, Lost in Garden, if you haven't done so. It's brilliant. Um, so when it comes to randomization in games, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, there's a lot of trickery going on um, that you might have to adjust for. Um, and that's usually the case that people complain about something not being that ram random, when in fact it's very random uh, indeed. Uh, but it's not perceived as such. Um, a common complaint that not really falls under games, uh, but it, you've probably ran into it, it's the shuffle function in music players. Like, iTunes randomization has been rewritten several times to try to match what people perceive as being a satisfactory randomized playlist. Uh, <laughs> or like, just the other day I had hit shuffle, on uh, Spotify, and I just expect that being like some sort of an entity that just have every song in like a, a cassette tape or something, and then it just put it in a player and then removes that and put in another one. But all of a sudden it just played the same song twice, and I guess, I guess that was fairly random, but that wasn't what I expected from Shuffle. Like, I interpret Shuffle to be something different than that, so, but it was very random, <laughs> but didn't expect that. Um, so there are several things to take into consideration here, depending on what you want to achieve. Um, do you want your randomization outcome to be repeatable, for instance? Um, so as long as you can save your seed value, uh, you can run a random uh, number generation again and get the same results. For instance, like if the player, um, if you have a game and you have like random loot drops, for instance, and the player dies in that room and respawn again, do you want them to have the same randomized object they would have got if they died, or do you want to run that again? And what implication does that have for the overall, uh, overall game feeling? Um, so the problem with that type of approach, though, is that you can, uh, depending on what type of randomization system or solution you use for your game, is that you can run into a couple of nasty edge cases. And those are basically the ones you should consider, uh, like think more about what edge cases there are. Um, and if they would occur, is it fine, uh, for instance, uh, or do you need to prevent certain things from happening? So, in older iterations of Tetris, for instance, I had this problem with edge cases. Um, it basically ran a two-step process uh, where it first rolled an eight-sided die to decide um, which piece to spawn. Uh, but if you rolled an eight, since there are only seven pieces, it did a re-roll of a seven-sided die. And which could actually result in what is known as a straight route. Uh, meaning that you would, for instance, rarely actually get one of the straight pieces, and you could like have uh, go without the straight piece for like 80 pulls in a row or more. Um, so since the early 2000s, I think it is, uh, Tetris has actually uh, changed the process, uh, randomization process for for um, for the blocks. Um, so Tetris utilizes what is known as a sampling without replacement approach. Uh, so it has a set pool of different pieces. Uh, that are shuffled into different buckets, and each randomization uh, takes one of those buckets and then pulls one piece out of that. And so each time you get one piece from that bucket, you are more likely to get another type of piece at the next time. Uh, but you're always guaranteed within a certain amount of time to get a straight piece. Um, 
The opposite uh, solution to that is what is known as sampling with, with replacement. <coughs> and this functions as you pull numbers out of a bucket, for instance, and then after uh, you've done so, you record what you've got, and then that ran random number goes back in again. Um, so you have the cha same chance of actually getting the same thing again at the next draw. And that is actually used in Arkham Horror, the card game, as, uh, which I use as an example here, because that's exactly how it functions. So I think it was like the easiest example of it. Um, so in this context, that actually works perfectly, since you know this game aesthetics of Arkham Horror is like dread and cosmic horror, and ugh, everything is terrible. So is our randomization. <laughs> um, and it also means that the bag function as a, an adjustable die, for instance. Like, if you want to have a harder difficulty, you can just, you know, add or remove certain pieces from the bag. Or if you want it to be easier, that works as well. Um, so that's really interesting. Mm. Ano another version of sampling without replacement approach is what Shea Pierce, uh, one of the developers of Hearthstone, calls a uh, pity timer. So usually when game says like this sword has a 50% uh, chance of a critical hit, it might not actually be purely 50% chance. 50% uh, chance of something occurring, that's like a coin toss. Um, but in theory, you could flip a coin a thousand times and still end up with the same result. It's just, you know, highly unlikely, but still a possibility. And that would be truly random, right? <laughs> And that's a typical edge case. You might not want the player to, to have that experience. So one way to prevent this is to set it up so for every time something doesn't happen, uh, make sure to increase the chance of it actually happening. So once it has uh, happened, you just reset that timer. So because a 50% chance of a critical hit is more about what, it, what feels like 50% chance of a hit, critical hit rather than what actually 50% is. I think it's uh, is it Diablo 3 that uh, utilizes uh, a similar system for their loot drop table. Like uh, f uh, from playtest, they learned that, that players, if they haven't uh, received a, a legendary loot drop at a certain point, they just like drop out of the game. So they have a system running in the back that just secure it. If you haven't got the, uh, they just um, increases the chance of you getting a critical uh, or a legendary loot drop at some point. So you always guarantee to get one within a certain t time. So you don't get bored. <laughs> or maybe you have a game with a high amount of chance, a chance elements. And how do you then present this as if the player has agency over the outcome? And I'm using Mario Party here as an example. Uh, so the die in Mario Party is uh, more like a display, uh, but the results has already been decided. Like when you pick which which board you want to play, that's like the first time to actually decide what number you're going to get. That's when the randomization hitting actually hitting the block is just a formality to reveal what you have. Um, uh, so. It doesn't matter how long you wait. It doesn't matter when you hit it or how hard you press your buttons. It's you're always going to be the same number. You can actually see that in the early iteration of Mario Party. You can actually see like the number that pops up isn't the same number that is shown on the box. <laughs> they fix that later. <laughs> um, and even at certain phases, like they actually doing certain events, they decide like you could only get a number between like eight or ten. Uh, and that's the funniest part, like people go, yeah, if you time this correctly here, you always you get a 10. Mm -mm. No, you don't. <laughs> you can sure you can think you do, but you don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, and of course, just to mention it, because you can't have a talk about randomization in games without touching upon the randomization in Spelunky. Um, but like, there's a tons of analysis and, and articles and video, uh, videos of, of this online, so I'm not going to you know, uh, uh, butcher <laughs> this, this excellent system for you. Uh, so I think you should, uh, I should rather encourage you to have a look at uh, Derek Hughes' book, Spelunky, instead, where he just goes through all the systems they use for randomization of the levels in Spelunky. Um, the point of that is be, uh, being that don't underestimate the ratio of randomization and uh, 
the need of uh, design spaces. Every aspect of randomization in, in Spelunky is weighted in some way. Um, because in Splunk it's more important that the levels feel like they uh, contain challenges that are interesting and fair rather than be completely new experiences each, each time. Uh, so that's it. That's actually all you need to know <laughs> when it comes to how to think about random the randomness in your game. Um, it's all about the player experience in this case. Uh, what is fair and what feels uh, like a randomization. Um, and that doesn't always mean that you has to be as random as you think it needs to be. Um, so uh, that's just the approach we're taking. So lost in random is uh, more about you feeling lucky. It's uh, it's less uh, strategy and more tactics oriented. It's uh, more about dealing with the situation you're in ra right now rather than the long term planning. It's more on going on your acting on your guts, uh, your gut feel, use the force, whatever you want to call it. Like play with a hand you've been dealt, basically. <laughs> great plans, great visions, bulletproof success. That's great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. <laughs> okay, so might not be just that simple, but people say there aren't no, there are no silver bullets, uh, but I actually think there are. At least I have, I have discovered three of them. There's really three really simple things. Uh, all you need to have is like a really competent team, uh, you have to have a really good sense of camaraderie, uh, especially during the hard times when it's most important. And that's no matter if it's work-related or your personal life, like people you can trust and rely on. And um, playtest, <laughs> like playtest the shit of everything uh, as much as you can. Um, it's nothing is ever done until you actually put it in somebody's hands and they get a sense of that they won't let go. Seems like we had another leak. I have to do a, something about this when I get back to the office. Um, so, sorry about the video frame rate. I've tried to fix it and I didn't manage to. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, I, 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 I mm, gotta say my voice. <laughs> I really can't stop gushing. Like, even on my grumpiest days, like coming in early in the morning around 8 o'clock when there's still not m that many people around in the office and like just booting up the computer and like updating the latest uh, from yesterday, which I didn't have time to check out. And it's just like every morning I just feel, you know, truly mm, mm, blessed to be working on this project. Um, and I just like really stop and feel really... Mm, grateful to like be working with such uh, beautiful and talented people uh, at Soink. Like, th seriously, th th this is the favorite thing. Like, just the other day, um, I really got blown away by a couple of pots. Like, <laughs> like uh, I could probably like have a two-hour lecture about how these are the best motherfucking pots in a game ever. Uh, <laughs> like, that's how stoked I am. Like, oh, this is gonna, oh, oh. This is so awesome, and I can't wait to share it with you all. Um, um, like pointing out all the little things like, oh, you see this thing? I thought it should work like this, but then somebody more competent than I said, oh, that sounds dumb, we should do it like this instead. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna end this session with a backdrop of where my journey with uh, Soink began. Um, so, I have probably had several different perspectives of like what games and game industry in general, both as like a consumer and studying and freelancing and teaching and now back in the industry again. And there's just one, one really simp simple uh, uh, lesson or something uh, that I've learned. Um, and that is to really find what motivates you. Like, um, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, I re remember I said that like I, f I felt I had more reasons to leave than to stay. Like when, when you're standing at the when you're standing at the edge of a cliff, like be sure to bring a parachute. <laughs> um, you the only thing you can be sure of is like uh, you will land because uh, like you're in control of gravity. Um, you don't know when you will land, how you will land, where you will land, or in what <laughs> in what state you will land. But be sure that you will land. Um, because if you feel like you're stuck, um, you have greater success in going forward, but 
detaching you from what is you feel is holding you back. Uh, and it's, it's scary. It's like shitless. Like, really, it takes some courage to do that. Um, but you can't achieve a change if you're not... Um, if you're not cutting yourself free. Uh, and I found myself like among people who truly cares for one another, and I'm forever grateful to work in a place where like you can get a comforting hug or somebody who actually asks you, oh, how, how are you doing, and actually means it. Um, and especially during uh, when times are tough, like that's, that's golden. Um, so think about what motivates you and what enjoyment do you find in life. And What's your drive? And be humble when you figure out what it is that makes you tick. Because that's like, you, you can't put a price on that. Um, memento mori, I guess most of you are familiar with that term or the implication of it. Um, it's a term for portrayal of um, um, uh, death in art, uh, usually uh, associated with uses of uh, human skulls and hourglasses. Um, it's meant to remind you of the time you have, mm, and it's represented in many cultures, but mostly prominently in like early Christianity, where like concepts like life and death and the afterlife were really prominent roles. <laughs> uh, and it basically means remember death. So you can think of it like an antique version of the law of Jante, if you will. <laughs> um, and the term memento mori is believed to have originated from when a victorious uh, general of the Roman Empire paraded through Rome after a battle. And he was accompanied by a servant whose only task it was to walk behind the general and repeating the phrase, memento te mortalem esse, excuse my Latin pronunciation, uh, which loosely translates to remember you are mortal. So every time... I start to feel too confident or suddenly figure out the potential solution or see an opportunity uh, where all the pieces are starting to fall into place and I start to feel a little bit smug or like uh, over my own genius uh, before it's actually been <laughs> at all tested or implemented or even like talk to somebody else about it. Um, uh, I start to hear that familiar sound in the back of my head or what I like to think of as the, this century's version of Memento te mortal and esse echoing in the back of my head. That's great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's going to be great. It's 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 going to be great. Thank you. <laughs>